What purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask to address the House for one minute for the purposes of inquiring about next week's schedule. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I yield to the gentleman from Maryland, the majority leader, for the purposes of announcing next week's schedule. And I yield. I thank, I thank the gentleman for yielding. On Monday, the House will meet at 12.30 p.m. for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business, with votes postponed until 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for morning hour debate and 10 a.m. for legislative business and recess immediately for the former members' association annual meeting. The House will reconvene at approximately 11.30 a.m. Wednesday and Thursday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for legislative business. On Friday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. We'll consider several bills under suspension of the rules. A complete list of all suspension bills will be announced, as is the custom, by the close of business tomorrow. In addition, we'll consider H.R. 5297, the Small Business Lending Fund Act of 2010, and possibly H.R. 5175, the Disclose Act, and again, possible action on H.R. 4899, the Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2010. I thank, thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the gentleman, in addition to next week's schedule, uh, can the gentleman tell us what he expects to consider on the floor between now and the July 4th recess beyond next week? And I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. In addition to the legislation I've announced by, for next week, the, the Small Business Lending Act, the Disclosed Act, and the Supplemental, uh, we will also consider in the future uh, Wall Street Reform uh, Conference Report as the gentleman knows, the conference uh, is having its first session today as an open conference, full participation. Uh, I expect that to uh, hopefully uh, conclude uh, within the next uh, uh, few weeks, uh, perhaps sooner. Uh, and I expect to have that bill on the floor uh, and uh, to the President by the uh, uh, July 4th break. In addition to that, we have the American's job and Closing Tax Loopholes Act, which is being considered by the Senate now. We passed this bill, as you know, two weeks ago. Uh, the Senate, however, had left town, and they could not take action to extend unemployment and benefits and uh, to preclude cuts to Medicare payments to ensure seniors would get their doctors. I know the Senate is now working on this bill, and if they uh, amend it, we'll look at that and see that the House action, uh, what action might be necessary. In addition, uh, we are looking at a budget resolution. Well, we're still working with Chairman Spratt on a budget uh, budget resolution that showed that, uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, a cognizance of the uh, concerns that all of our members have, A, about the deficit and also about constraining spending. As the gentleman knows, the President has sent to us a budget uh, that for non-defense, non-security spending is frozen. Uh, uh, not only for this year, but for two years uh, to come. So we're, we're considering that. In addition, uh, the gentleman and I have been working very hard on RAN sanctions. Uh, I was at the White House today. I congratulated the President on the uh, administration's success uh, in uh, having passed through the Security Council the RAN sanctions legislation. It is good legislation. Uh, hopefully all, all nations will uh, abide by it have its impact. On the other hand, I think the gentleman and I both agree there need to be additional uh, efforts made. Uh, we urge the Europeans who will be meeting uh, shortly uh, uh, to do the same and hopefully have an even stronger resolution. And then it's my expectation, I've talked to Mr. Berman, uh, and I know you've talked to uh, Mr. Russ Leitman. Um, my hope is that we will have, and my, my request, <laughs> more than a hope, my request is that the uh, conference report uh, be brought to the floor uh, the week of the 21st, and I've indicated that that is my expectation. Uh, I want to also congratulate uh, Ambassador Susan Rice uh, for the job that she did in drafting this, uh, the resolution that was adopted and successfully passing it yesterday. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with the gentleman. In addition to that, as uh, you know, uh, we are have a supplemental uh, that we want to uh, uh, have considered. Uh, we need to fund our troops that are in harm's way, make sure they have the resources uh, necessary to carry out the mission that they've been given. 
uh, and I expect the supplemental to be on the floor uh, possibly as uh, early as uh, uh, next week. And I, I would hope uh, that we could get it that early, but uh, certainly uh, I expect it to pass uh, uh, before we leave. It's my understanding that funding is available into July uh, so that we have some flexibility, but my view is uh, that we uh, will pass it, uh, and I will be pushing very hard to pass the supplemental, make sure our troops are funded, and I would, uh, I would hope that uh, we could work on that on a bipartisan basis. Uh, that is, uh, that's not, the, not all that will be done, but that is uh, the significant parts of what I expect the agenda to be for the next three weeks. And I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman, and I specifically, Mr. Speaker, want to thank the gentleman for his efforts on behalf of trying to get uh, a resolution out of the conference committee on the Iran sanctions bill. Again, as he says, Mr. Speaker, something that he and I have worked on for some time now. Thank him for his commitment to that and working on that. Uh, I'd also ask uh, the gentleman uh, if uh, any of the reports uh, that I have heard about a possible resolution having to do with the flotilla uh, in terms of uh, the uh, actions that occurred that Israel undertook to defend itself uh, in interdicting the ship uh, on the alleged uh, mission of aid that it was claiming to be on and whether we can expect any resolution along those lines in support of our ally Israel. And I yield. I thank the gentleman uh, for his question. Uh, as I'm sure uh, most people know, the gentleman and I agreed. I made a statement on the floor last night and I made a statement immediately after. Uh, Israel, like any other nation in the world uh, that's assaulted by a terrorist organization that wants its demise, wants to kill its people and push it from its country. Uh, any nation on earth, including ours, uh, would uh, defend itself. That's what they did. Uh, they gave two weeks' notice, of course, as the gentleman knows, uh, to uh, the Turks and to the individuals who were undertaking this so-called uh, humanitarian mission. And I might say that the gentleman and I share a humanitarian concern about the plight of the Palestinian people. Unfortunately, they are ill-served uh, by some of those who have by force taken over their leadership in Gaza. But uh, Israel did what uh, any nation would do. Uh, it gave notice and said, if you will deliver those to Ashad, Ashad the uh, port, uh, we will offload the humanitarian material and make sure that it's delivered uh, to its recipients, not to uh, a terrorist organization that would use it for purposes of terror uh, and, and uh, attack on civilians, but use it uh, for the purposes of relieving uh, those uh, in, in uh, some distress. I would point out, as the gentleman Wells knows, uh, international reports are that, in fact, there are sufficient uh, uh, food and uh, medicine uh, in Gaza today. Uh, it is my view that that mission uh, in effect accomplished an object objective, and its objective was to create confrontation uh, and to uh, put at risk uh, the security of uh, Israel and its people. Uh, so that the answer to your question uh, is that uh, I have talked to Mr. Berman, and uh, I, I want to talk to you as well uh, so that we can uh, determine what is the best uh, course of action for us to take. Again, I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman for his uh, continued commitment uh, and share with him the commitment to strengthen the alliance uh, between ourselves and the United States and Israel uh, in the continuing struggle that all of us have uh, uh, in, in terms of pushing back against a terrorist threat, state sponsors of terror and their proxies in the Middle East, and as they pose the existential threats, uh, to our ally Israel, as well as U.S. interests in the region. So I look forward to working with him on that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would um, go back to the gentleman's statements with regards to uh, financial regulation uh, in the conference report. And I know there's been a lot of indication, especially on the part of Chairman Frank, uh, about the willingness to be open and uh, make sure that C-SPAN cameras are there so the public can understand and have access. I was somewhat alarmed, though, uh, with uh, the statements made by the chairman as reported in the press when he said some negotiations will take place more publicly than others and just wanted uh, to, uh, the gentleman to assure us that there will be no 
negotiations ongoing without having the light of cameras on and or at least a fair hearing among members of both parties. And I yield. I thank the gentleman for his question. Uh, none of us want to commit to, to not talking to one another privately, I think. I think that's what the chairman was referring to. I'm sure that he and Mr. Dodd uh, will speak. Uh, I'm sure that uh, he and the gentleman from Alabama, uh, the ranking Republican, may even Mr. Shelby may be speaking as a uh, he and, uh, the chairman and I both served with Mr. Shelby. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that there will be discussions uh, with the ranking Republican from our side that may not be in the context of the conference itself where there will be cameras, where there will be an open opportunity to uh, offer amendments and uh, fully debate and discuss uh, various uh, options. And I think that's, uh, uh, frankly, uh, I've, not, I've not been too pleased personally with the fact that we don't have a lot of conferences. I think conferences are uh, good. I think they accomplished a, a, a worthy objective of bringing reconciliation between the two houses and, for, for, frankly, uh, giving uh, an opportunity for each uh, perspective that's represented on the conference to be articulated. But, uh, and I think this will be, the, from that standpoint, a model conference. And I think Mr. Frank uh, does intend, as he has said, uh, to have an open uh, conference with full debate and uh, voting uh, in the light of day on uh, various different uh, proposals. I thank, thank, the, thank the gentleman for that. And in that spirit, Mr. Speaker, of uh, wanting to try and work together in a civil manner, uh, and to try and get the work of the people done. The gentleman mentioned the war supplemental and uh, for scheduling perhaps next week. And obviously we continue to be concerned, Mr. Speaker, on the part of uh, you know, our members, their constituents, about the involvement, openness of discussion, debate around the issue of the spending in the supplemental bill uh, to fund our troops. And this is actually, Mr. Speaker, a bill we can work on together. And uh, the gentleman indicates that, uh, that that bill may be coming to the floor. And I would ask the gentleman, should we expect that bill to go through the Appropriations Committee before it comes to the floor to allow for that open input, that collaboration uh, to result in uh, a better bill that would reflect the will of the American people? And I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I have not uh, uh, discussed specifically what actions uh, Mr. Obi, uh, Mr. Obi is looking at the supplemental that was sent uh, over to us, uh, and uh, he's discussing it with the various subcommittee chairs, I know. I don't know whether he's discussed it with Mr. Lewis at this point in time, uh, but uh, um, not Mr. Lewis. Who's the ranking? Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been off the committee for a few years now uh, with Mr. Lewis, but uh, I do know that, uh, as you know, he had a markup scheduled on our supplemental uh, the week before we left. That, that was canceled, so it didn't go forward, and then the Senate passed its bill. But uh, I would certainly uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, your side has input on what uh, well, we want, uh, what you want, what you think ought to be in there. Uh, obviously, we want to respond to some of the crisis, not only uh, offshore in Iraq, uh, uh, in uh, well, this is mainly Afghanistan and Pakistan, as the gentleman knows, but uh, uh, my belief is that Mr. Obi will want to have input as well. So I can't give you specifically because Mr. Obi has not indicated to me at this um, point in time well, what I, his I, specific I, plans are. But I, I understand I, the gentleman's uh, uh, interest. I thank the gentleman for that, Mr. Speaker, and I would indicate that having spoken with the appropriators that Mr. Lewis has not heard from Mr. Obi on that, and we will wait uh, to hear, and I'm sure he is uh, anxiously awaiting. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would also like to ask uh, the gentleman about uh, the budget and what we can expect as far as the budget. Uh, having now been in June, uh, there having been no budget, and uh, can we expect a markup uh, in the Budget Committee prior to our leaving July 4th recess. I yield. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, as you know, Mr. Spratt and I and others uh, have been working on this uh, uh, for many months now to try to see if there is a budget that can garner uh, majority support. There was some indication, uh, I will tell the gentleman, he's usually at the White House with us. He wasn't here today. 
but uh, Mr. Cantor is usually joining us at the, at the White House in our meetings with the President. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, the Senate Republican leader indicated he'd like to see some bipartisan agreement, uh, at least uh, on uh, uh, spending levels, uh, and, and observed that he thought that the spending levels the President had sent down uh, for our consideration were uh, he would like to see a lower number, but uh, he appreciated the fact that that number was sent down and uh, was a constraint on uh, uh, spending. In fact, froze non-defense, non-security spending at last year's levels uh, and did so for a number of years. So that uh, I made the observation at that point in time, I was hopeful that we, in fact, could perhaps reach some bipartisan agreement. And I will be discussing with the gentleman uh, uh, either later, to probably early next week, uh, that possibility. But I will tell you that the, Mr. Spratt continues to work very, very hard at trying to see if he can come up with a budget resolution that uh, uh, reflects uh, something that can get agreement. I, I want to tell the gentleman that uh, uh, one of the problems we have, as the gentleman knows, is we have created a situation uh, of where the budget will have some very tough numbers on it. They are realistic numbers. They are the numbers. They are what they are. We are what we are. As the gentleman knows, I believe that we need to work very, very hard uh, to get back to the place where we were in, in 2020, uh, actually start of 2001 when we had a, a balanced budget and a surplus projected. Uh, I would call attention to statement of Doug Holtz Eakin, who I'm sure the gentleman knows, uh, who was uh, w with the uh, last administration indicated uh, that this budget would have occurred under uh, uh, Senator McCain as well, no matter what he did. Uh, we inherited an extraordinarily depressed economy, uh, an exploding deficit, uh, and uh, a decrease, a substantial decrease in revenues. Uh, so we have an extraordinarily difficult situation that we've inherited and we're trying to deal with. The President, uh, as you know, has appointed a commission to try to deal with that. We put in place uh, statutory pay-go uh, to try to constrain spending uh, so that we can get back to, as where I said we were in the uh, four years before the Bush administration, where we had four years of surplus. Um, and uh, regrettably, we're not there now, but we're working on it. I thank, thank the gentleman for that, and would, uh, he knows where I stand on that issue and where our side is uh, continuing willing to uh, want to see a budget, uh, just like most of the American people are having to do every day, is come up with a budget of how they can make their businesses work and their families make it through the month. So I appreciate that uh, spirit with which the gentleman offers that. Mr. Speaker. I would say to the gentleman that I read an article in Roll Call this week uh, that uh, had to do with these colloquies uh, that somehow indicated that the gentleman and I were unable to come to the floor and to play, quote unquote, nice together. Uh, I will say I know the gentleman doesn't take uh, any of this personally, nor do I, because I enjoy coming to the floor uh, to debate substance and policy in these colloquies, something that frankly is not done often enough in this House, but as it relates to the priorities that the majority has as reflected through its scheduling abilities. Uh, and in fact, again, Mr. Speaker, this House doesn't do nearly enough of this kind of exchange uh, of opinion uh, to ferret out how we can come to some agreement. So I know that the gentleman shares in that spirit uh, as we uh, engage, specifically as that article points to, over our differences, our differences about the priority of cutting spending now. Uh, and I, I know the gentleman does know, as I value, the opportunities to work with him. Uh, on issues, as we have just discussed, having to do with uh, the promotion of the U.S. security in the Middle East as it plays out through our ally Israel. Uh, I enjoy the working relationship that we have had on that issue, the issue around uh, the Iran sanctions resolution, as well as he knows uh, as well we've worked together well on the issue of Puerto Rico statehood. Uh, so there is that history. 
But I would say again, there is going to be times where we do disagree. Uh, and there is, frankly, some disagreement uh, that our side has with what the majority does in terms of scheduling, and, and that is its priorities on cutting spending. We become very frustrated that we have no other vehicle to speak out as to the priorities of the majority other than our response to the scheduling. Uh, and these colloquies are focused on priorities the majority has as far as, it's, as how it schedules this floor. We become very frustrated as well, Mr. Speaker, that every time we begin even to hint at a desire to bring spending cuts to the floor, that somehow we need a lecture on the last couple decades as to what's happened in this country from a fiscal standpoint. As a gentleman knows, I'm the first one to offer up some contrition. Yes, our side is to blame as much as the other side for bringing us to this point. But none of that has anything to do with scheduling for the next week or the week thereafter. And what my aim is, hopefully the gentleman knows, in engaging in these discussions is to say, please, allow us to bring up some of the, in, for some of the issues that the American people want us to do, which is to stop the spending now. Uh, and as the gentleman knows, uh, we have uh, launched on the Republican side of the aisle and a program called UCUT. Uh, and, and frankly, we have seen some bipartisan support um, of programs under UCUT. Uh, we have seen the administration take on an announcement today, uh, a proposal in UCUT to sell excess federal property. Uh, we want this to be a bipartisan issue. Uh, and as the gentleman has reminded me, as he said in the article, uh, that this is a colloquy based on scheduling. So, Mr. Speaker, I would say that the minority, the Republicans in this House, uh, intend on bringing, bringing to the House floor another U-cut vote next week. Uh, and it will be one of five options that the public will be voting on uh, and has begun already. And we are well over 700,000 votes in UCUT on a three-week period. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, I think that indicates uh, some real intensity behind the public wanting this House to finally stop spending now. So we will, Mr. Speaker, be uh, bringing to the floor um, a vote either on the attempt to sell excess federal property uh, which is a $15 billion savings, uh, a, a provision to terminate a federal bike and walking program. It's another $1.8 billion. Uh, terminate a federal truck parking program, $62.5 million. Terminating a funding for private bus companies, $120 million. Or a proposal to terminate the Ready to Learn TV program at $270 million of savings. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, to the gentleman, the purpose of our bringing these to the floor is, first of all, to reflect the will of the American people to cut now, to go forward, to, to admit we are in a real tough situation fiscally in this country. We're at a crossroads. We've got to start changing the culture here in Washington. So I would say to the gentleman, that is the purpose, as well as, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have no other alternative unless the majority would schedule actual spending cuts for this debate and vote uh, on the House floor. I would also say to the gentleman, Mr. Speaker, these votes will occur and we will proffer these each week. This will begin to amass a record on which member supports spending cuts now and which doesn't. We have already demonstrated a commitment on this, this side of the aisle as well as some on the gentleman's side of the aisle to cut $85 billion over the last three votes in UCUT and will continue to do that each week. And I would hope that the gentleman uh, could join us in, in reflecting the priorities that our constituents are asking us uh, to put forward, and that is to get the federal deficit under control. 
So with that, General, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, would, uh, uh, I would thank the gentleman uh, for his time um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll yield to him for response. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I want to tell my friend that I don't seek uh, contrition. Uh, I, do see, I do seek reconsideration uh, of policies that have not worked, of uh, policies that were projected to grow the economy, uh, bring the deficit down, uh, and uh, make us a healthier, wealthier country. Uh, frankly, uh, the policies that we pursued in uh, 2001 uh, through 2006, uh, and actually through 2009, uh, because we couldn't change policy, although we were in charge of the House and the Senate, we couldn't override a presidential veto. Uh, again, not contrition, but recognition that the policies did not work. You know, Benjamin Franklin said uh, it's not a good thing to be penny wise and pound foolish. I tell my friend that he and his colleagues from 2001 to 2006, and I think he voted for each one of these, voted for over $2 trillion dollars in unfunded spending. Two trillion dollars in unfunded spending. Uh, that is the real problem. Uh, the gentleman is probably prepared to support, as I am. And he and I will probably vote together, I hope, on a supplemental that provides for funding our troops. Uh, that won't be paid for. We will expect our children and grandchildren to pay for that. Mr. Obey has suggested a tax uh, to pay for this war. If it's worth fighting, if it's worth protecting this generation, it's worth uh, uh, paying for. Uh, I tend to agree with that. Uh, I have, uh, as the gentleman knows, I'm a lot older than he is, three grandchildren, and I have a great-granddaughter. Uh, tragically, history tells us that my grandchildren and my children are going to have their challenge from a security standpoint, from a health standpoint, from a natural uh, disaster standpoint, as we have today. And they're going to have to have resources to respond to that. So uh, rather than, uh, and I don't criticize the gentleman, I'm, and I, I applaud him for asking the American public, but all ask the American public, what do you think we ought to cut? Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, your side has a, your, your ranking member has prepared a budget. As I've told you before, I think it's a very, uh, a budget with a great deal of integrity, uh, a great deal of political courage. And the gentleman's indicated it's a 75-year budget. We really, frankly, need to look. It has a, it's a budget that affects today, tomorrow, but yes, it has a vision. I applaud uh, Mr. Ryan. As you know, I'm a big fan of Mr. Ryan's. I don't agree with Mr. Ryan. But I don't have to agree with somebody to have great respect for their intellect and their political courage and their willingness to be real, to put something on the table that uh, really will make a difference. Um, and my side, for the most part, doesn't agree with his treatment of Social Security, Medicare, and some other things. But uh, I asked the gentleman last time if, if he wants me to put that budget on the floor when, it, when whatever we put on the floor uh, on our side so that both of those can be considered. We're prepared to do that. Um, but, my friend, I will tell you, I'm, I'm not looking, as I said before, uh, for contrition. But I am looking for recognition that we need to work together and be honest. Be honest with those American people that you're uh, asking questions to. Uh, that uh, the items you put on your list are worthy of consideration. But they will not get us to where we need to get. As Mr. Eakin, who was one of McCain's advisors, former director, Republican director of the OMB, as the Cato Institute indicates, uh, the policies of the Bush administration dug a very deep hole. You can have contrition about it, but that doesn't solve it. What's got to solve it is us coming together and being honest with the American people that's what the Commission is hopefully going to do, and it's going to give us tough recommendations. And we will have to clasp hands together, frankly, uh, if those recommendations are real, honest, and effective, because they will be politically mm -hmm. controversial, mm -hmm. because the medicine uh, doesn't always go down very well. Uh, but we have all dug a hole. Uh, 
I was not for most of the Bush policies that put us in those holes. Uh, I think giving up revenues, that's part of the $2 trillion of, of uh, uh, spending that you made. You cut revenues, but you did not pay for them. The courageous, in, strike that. The thing to do if you're going to cut taxes, cut spending. American public understand that. Yeah. If, but pay for what you're still going to buy. Don't expect the credit card to be used by us and paid for by our children. Uh, so I tell my friend that uh, uh, the individual items uh, uh, which you have just outlined are worthy of consideration. And asking the American public their uh, recommendation uh, is absolutely the right thing for us to do as a democratic body. But let us not uh, uh, kid the people uh, that uh, uh, we cannot, uh, that we can deal uh, with the budget hole that has been uh, dug uh, over the last eight years from surplus to deep deficit, surplus in 01, deep deficit in 09, January of 09, uh, is going to be solved by simply nibbling around the edges. No matter how big those figures may sound, and they are big, uh, but in the magnitude of the problem that confronts us, uh, they will not get us to where we need to be. I thank the gentleman for giving me uh, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman, and uh, I would say I, I hear the gentleman that he thinks that contrition is not enough. I hear the gentleman who says that he and his side is to blame as well. And I think enough is enough about going backwards. And a gentleman's heard me before on the floor in these colloquies uh, quote Winston Churchill when he said, of this I am quite sure that if we open a quarrel between the past and present, we shall find that we have lost our future. And I would say to the gentleman, uh, in the spirit of that quote, let's go forward. Both of us can differ on policy, but it seems that the gentleman is more interested uh, in settling a score to have this side of the aisle admit that somehow our policies were failing. I have sat here, I think most of my colleagues on this side of the aisle will say, spending was too high. The gentleman indicates that we voted on $2 trillion of spending while we were in the majority uh, last over the last several years. Well, the gentleman yield, just to clarify, uh, are you? we all voted for more spending than that over that period of time, given the size of our budget. What I said was, to be precise, uh, you voted for $2 trillion of unpaid spending. I thank, thank, I thank the gentleman for you. Thank the gentleman for that correction. Uh, and would say that with that $2 trillion figure out there, we could also look to see how much spending is going on now. And the national debt has increased by $4 trillion since the Democratic Party took control of this Congress. And we've added $4.8 billion in debt per day under this president. So there is no side immune to blame for more spending, which is why we continue to plea that let's work together now. Let's not kick the can down the road. The gentleman continues to say that the UCUT proposals are too small, though worthy, too small to even fix any problem. That is not true, Mr. Speaker. We're about trying to change the culture here in Washington. The gentleman shares with me concern about the life our kids, their kids, and theirs will have in this country, given the actions we're taking and those we're not on the floor of this House. Uh, and so I thank the gentleman again for his willingness to engage in these substantive discussions. We need more of these debates on substance in the workings of this House, uh, and I appreciate, again, his time, and I yield back, Mr. Speaker.